Hello and welcome to Apache Tinker Pop's home here on Twitch. Uh, today we have another Tinker Pop wide stream uh, where we explore the wider Tinker Pop community, looking at tools, libraries, uh, or graph systems built on the Tinker Pop framework, uh, or even applications that are built um, on these foundations. Uh, today we're, we have uh, Kelvin Lawrence uh, and Taylor Riggin. Uh, to talk about the uh, graph notebook, which allows you to interact with any Tinkerpop enabled graph system uh, using Jupyter. Uh, so Ke uh, Kelvin Taylor, uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks for having us back, Stephen. Okay, um, so how do, uh, how do we want to start out? Um, we want to spend most of our time, I think, showing folks some demos, because that's always more fun than just listening to people talk. But maybe I'll just start by describing what we're going to be talking about. Some people watching have hopefully already seen or used what we're going to be talking about. But um, I personally have always enjoyed working with systems, databases, whatever it is, using Jupyter Notebooks. They've been around you know, well over 10 years at this point. And er early in my time working with Tinkerpop, someone had done a piece of work that allowed Gremlin and Titan and a <clears throat> Gremlin server to hook up to a sort of rudimentary Jupyter Notebook and <clears throat> excuse me, send some queries and see the results. And that got me kind of hooked actually at the time on, on Jupyter Notebooks and anyone who's done data science work or, or other analytics and things that lend themselves to that environment, I think will probably feel the way I do and really enjoy the sort of joining of where you can have Python code and database queries and all sorts of other things going on all in a single place, web hosted, the ability to share the work with others easily, that kind of thing. And so what, what we have worked on over the last several years, and we've done all this in open source, and Taylor will also you know, make sure people know where the GitHub repo is and how to install and run everything we're going to show. So Im important point, I guess, number one is everything we're showing is available as open source. Um, but we've been working on this uh, Jupyter Notebook experience that we call Graph Notebook. And fundamentally, it, it was built as a way to easily access not just actually Gremlin graphs, but even RDF graphs as well. So it, it can connect to a number of different graph database stores. And we've added magics, and Taylor will explain what a magic is as we go through, that allow you to easily say, I want to um, run a graph query against this database. I want to see a visualization of it, um, interact with it, maybe even take the results of my query, put it into Python code, and in another cell in the notebook, do some additional computation. and. This fills a nice gap where we're not trying to be a full IDE. So I know a lot of people will be familiar with the work that the G.V um, product does. And we're definitely not in the same exact space there. That's more of an IDE Gremlin developer experience where this is more <clears throat> graph analytics, graph uh, sort of integration, not such a dynamic um, explorer kind of a tool. Um, but it does fit really well in, into that sort of joining point of data scientists, computer programmers, end users who want to write a few graph queries, but want to do it in an easy to use um, environment. And so, so with that, Taylor, why don't you take over and start showing folks um, how it all works? Sure. Thanks, Kelvin. So I, I think I would probably just want to start off with uh, giving you some background on Jupyter, because um, I think most people, from what I've seen, uh, may or may not have some background in using Jupyter. Um, Jupyter was originally developed as a uh, kind of a web-based REPL environment um, uh, for for people using Python, Julia, or R. The, the kind of the name Jupyter actually came out of those three original languages, and so it was really kind of meant for data anal analyst or data scientist who who wanted to be able to write some some shareable scripts and workflows using Jupyter or, or Julia or, or R. Uh, and share those with other data analysts and data scientists. Uh, so we see this often in the the data science community, especially ML practitioners quite use this quite often, um, which also does kind of lend itself well to, to graph because we have a lot of folks coming from those backgrounds that that actually want to use a graph database for various uh, data analytics or data scientist types of work, work, work workflows. Um, so just to kind of give you some background, if you've never used Jupyter before, I'm logged into Jupyter server. It's actually running on my local machine. Um, and I have uh, a series of, of notebooks, and we'll kind of walk through what, what each of these are. 
Um, but just to get started, when you when you load up Jupiter for the first time, you won't see anything here. Uh, what you'll end up doing is coming here over here on the right hand side, this drop down menu, and going to New, and you can you can create a new notebook. Um, and specifically for a graph notebook, we have a, a notebook type called Python 3, which allows you to run Python 3 code. Uh, but you can create a new notebook here. Uh, that will bring up this notebook interface, you know, a blank interface. Uh, nothing will be here. And you can just do simple Python code, right? You can just you know write whatever Python you want and run it uh, within these, these blocks. They're called cells, right? So you can write out your code. You can hit the little run button here. And, and run whatever code you want. Uh, the power of this really comes into play when you start adding what are called Jupyter magics, kind of what Kelvin was alluding to. So Jupyter ships with a bunch of built-in magics, and you can see all these using this percent ls magic command. All the magics kind of start with either a, a single percent sign or, or two percent signs. Uh, a single percent sign is what they call line magic, uh, which means It'll, it'll run with a single line, whatever parameters right after it. Uh, a cell magic, which was 2% two, two signs, will run with that magic anything else in the cell. <clears throat> so you can see here, you have all these different kind of built-in magics. You kind of look closely enough, though, you'll begin to see some things that are are pretty interesting for uh, from a Tinkerpot perspective, right? You have these uh, you know, Grim, Gremlin status, uh, Graph Notebook, Graph Hove. These, these are all magics that we have added as part of the Graph Notebook project. So we've, we've added in some initial libraries here to interact with the graph. Um, just to, so you can see how this is configured to get start to start with, if I do a graph notebook config, which is also one of our magics that we have, uh, this will output the, the actual config. This is how the notebook is connecting to my underlying graph database. Um, in this particular case, I'm actually connecting to Gremlin server. Uh, I have a Gremlin server container that's running on my local machine at, at with this Docker name and this Docker port. It's running the Gremlin server Docker container. Um, it will get into a little bit more of you know how you can deploy this locally, but effectively for right now, you can kind of see here how you would go through and configure this to run uh, with you know a, a backend store. You'll also notice there are some other things uh, that refer to things like Sparkle. Uh, Graph Notebook supports uh, a few different backend uh, graph data frameworks, right? Uh, Tinkerpop primarily, but we also support RDF and Sparkle. You can also run open cipher queries using using this notebook, and we'll, we'll dive into all of that here shortly. Um, so, so let's do that. So I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to flip over, uh, go back to the, the my main page here. And with Graph Notebook, we, we've added in a bunch of sample notebooks. So when you launch this for the first time, you'll see all these directories that come with Graph Notebook, uh, setting get, getting started notebooks. Uh, there's also language tutorials here. So if you want to learn, you know, Sparkle and OpenCypher, you can you can dive into that a little more detail. We even have things like sample applications. So if you want to dive in and look at how to use a, a graph for fraud detection or how to build a security graph, there are all these different uh, example notebooks that have details of how to build these and run queries specific to those use cases. Uh, just for demonstration purposes, uh, let's kind of dive into uh, this visualization notebook here um, called Air Routes Gremlin. I've already got loaded on over here on, on this page. Um, this will take us through using Kelvin's uh, ever popular air routes data set. <laughs> we'll use this in a lot of different uh, places for, for examples, including Kelvin's book, uh, Practical Gremlin. Uh, but we're going to use this as a way of exploring Graph Notebook. Um, so to start with, you know, we have all of these magics to look at, say, what version of Graph Notebook we're going to use, right? Uh, are we currently using? So we can do a percent Graph Notebook version. This is the current version, which is 3.8.2. Uh, just downloaded this late yesterday. Um, we can also look at the config, which I already showed you. Uh, there are also a handful of these magics that are um, specific to Amazon Neptune, right? We 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 built this uh, uh, we built Graph Notebook to work with Neptune. So there are some things that are a little specific to Neptune. Um, I will actually show you what these look like on Neptune, but for now, I'm using Gremlin Server. So we'll, we'll skip past these. One of them is a status magic, which will show you the status of your, your Neptune cluster. Um, you also have ways of, of configuring this uh, 
a little more straightforward versus having to fill out this full JSON doc um, and change the, the full config. You can just change the, the host name that you're connecting to uh, for the underlying database. So if I wanted to, I could just do graph notebook host and this and change this to point to whatever graph database endpoint I want to point to. All right. Um, once you have graph notebook configured, uh, the next thing to do is maybe you want to load some data, right? Uh, we've made this really easy using a, a, a magic called seed. Uh, so seed allows us to load in a, a, a number of sample data sets that actually ship with graph notebook. They're embedded into the graph notebook stack. If I go here to samples, um, I can go to data model. I can select between property graph or RDF. Um, I can choose whatever query language I want for property graph. So in this case, using Gremlin. And then I have these, these six different data sets. Uh, you'll notice some of these align with the sample applications that I was showing earlier, right? So there's a fraud data set that, that goes along with the, the fraud graph examples. Uh, there's also a, a knowledge graph data set. So in this particular case, we're going to use error outs. I've already loaded the error outs data set. Um, so we'll actually get into that. But if I wanted to load that, I could just click on error outs, hit submit. And this will go off and it will load in the air outs data set. Uh, some of you may be asking, well, what's the data format for, for this? Like, what is it actually loading in? Uh, well, this is actually a, a set of text files that just contain Gremlin queries. So if you wanted to, you could actually go up here to custom, uh, supply the, 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 the data model that you want, say Gremlin, and specify either a local location or an, an S3 location and, and load in your own your own files uh, in, in using the seed command. You can go create your own Gremlin files and load those into uh, your target graph. This can be, again, this seed works with Gremlin server. It works with, with Neptune. It works with other Tinkerpop compliant databases as well. So this is another way of kind of loading data in. And Taylor, probably worth pointing out those in the Gremlin case, those files would just be rows of add V and add E steps to to create the graph. exactly so yeah. if, if you can write by hand add v and add e steps you can create a seed file yeah um i won't cover it in too much detail but i'll just kind of mention this uh there is a utility out there and, and maybe uh either steven or kelvin can drop a link to that in the in the chat if you're interested but there's a utility we've actually created that takes like the csv format that we use for uh neptune's bulk loader um and, and can actually create those those uh, Gremlin query files for you to use with seed. Kind of created a conversion script that actually converts just CSV file format into to Gremlin add V, add E steps. So um, something to note if you actually want to use this you know, for your examples or just use it for your own purposes. All right, so from there, before I kind of dive into uh, the next part here, well, actually, let's just go ahead and dive into this. So uh, there's a bunch of documentation here that kind of talks about uh, the different aspects of visualization, and uh, we'll come back to that. But to start with, I just want to kind of show you what, what running a query inside of uh, the notebooks looks like. So to start with, um, we have these magics for each of the different languages, right? There's a, a Gremlin magic, which we'll go through here today. There's also, just to let you know, there's a Sparkle magic and also an open cipher magic, which we actually just note as OC. So you have each of these three different cell magics that you can use to run queries against your target data store. Uh, obviously the target data store has to support those languages. Um, so in this case, we're using Gremlin server, we're just gonna use the Gremlin cell magic. And, and to get uh, an idea of what all the parameters that cell magic takes, you can just uh, post pin a uh, dash dash help and um, because this is a cell magic, it actually expects some sort of input here in the cell. So that's why that X is there. But here you can get an idea of all of the stuff that you can use, uh, all the different parameters you can use with the Gremlin cell magic. Some of these, again, you know, a lot of this is, is built for Neptune. Um, uh, some of it's built for Neptune. So some of these things like the, the profile parameters and such are all Neptune specific, but, uh, the majority of these others around uh, the display hints and stuff are all uh, you're able to use those against any Tinkerpop compatible backend. Right. So let's kind of dive into this a little more. 
Uh, just to start with, before we kind of get into these other examples, let me just show you a basic, you know, Gremlin hello world, right? You know, g.v limit one, right? So this is calling Gremlin server my backend, calling the air outs database, and it's pulling in uh, the first vertex that it finds, right? Um, this output here is essentially an I table, right? Uh, so you can get the the outputs of the query, and and if there are different, if there are a number of different result sets, it will actually list them all here. It actually will paginate as well. So if you have more than ten, so I just do a limit twenty. This will fill in this table with twenty results. Well, at least it should fill in the table with twenty results. Let's go back and do this again. Let's do 11 just to make sure. There you go. So I've got 11, I got the first 10 results and then I can paginate over and see the 11th result there. Um, this also has a, a, a metadata tab here. This actually shows the execution time. This is the round trip execution times. So this is not the actual query execution time. So this is essentially how long it takes for me to actually send this query from the notebook to Gremlin server and then get a response back. Uh, so this is useful if you're just doing experimentation and playing around. Um, if you are doing workflows where you actually want to take these results and then do something else with them, Gremlin, the Gremlin Magic also has a store to parameter where you can actually store the results into a, uh, a Python variable, right? So just put any arbitrary variable name here. And in the following cell, I could just call that variable and you can see here's here's the list of results that I've got for from that query. So then if you want to actually take the results and then use them in a, a separate Python workflow, um, you can you can do that. You can also turn off the I table by doing dash dash silent. So if you don't want to see the I table, you just want to get the results back, you could do that. So that's kind of the, the basic functionality for for using uh, the the Gremlin cell magic. Uh, one thing you'll have noted, if I go back to this, actually turn off silent, is the I table itself. I can get it to come back. I'm not sure why it's acting up here. The I table itself doesn't have a a path output to it, right? Well, okay. I may have to flip over to a different version of the notebook. This is acting up for some reason. This is running on a container on my local machine. It's running a bunch of other containers. So, um, but the I table itself doesn't have an, an output to that that notebook, right? Or a, a graph output. It has just the output of results. Let me actually flip over here. I've got the same notebook. There we go. Da, 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 da. Let's do this again. Gremlin g.v limit 10. All right. So I've got the, those 10 results. Um, there's no there's no graph output for this, right? So kind of visualization of the graph. Uh, one of the things we've added into this is if gr the Gremlin query itself outputs a a path object. Um, so if I'm doing say g.v has label airport dot out route dot limit ten dot path uh, might be airport. Right now that I've got a set of paths here, all of a sudden there's a new tab that comes available. It's this graph tab, right? And inside this graph tab, I now actually have a fun little, you know, reactive visualization here of, of the query results. So this is kind of where the, the notebooks really become come in handy as, as a developer, as you're writing graph queries and you're trying to kind of grok what the results of that graph query look like. Uh, you can you can extract a path from that query and see through this visualization kind of what the results look like uh, um, as they're as they're returning. So uh, in this case, the path only actually has the the vertex IDs for the airports. Um, so uh, all we're seeing here is uh, you know in, in the visualization is a, just a label of airport. 
Um, as I kind of get into the the further examples, we'll see how we can can modify this and change the behavior around to fit our different needs. So, and that kind of follows on in the next example here. The Gremlin magic itself has the ability to supply a bunch of hints um, that you can feed into the visualizer. Um, one of the ways we can do that is we can supply these uh, uh, essentially like, uh, uh, set labels um, for the individual uh, uh, vertex types and, and edge types. So if I want to supply uh, node labels for airports and denote that I want to see the city property for an airport and also route edges and see the distance property for a route edge, I can add those into these, these uh, some simple JSON objects. And then when I'm actually querying this, via the Gremlin cell magic, uh, I can then specify these as, as hints to the visualizer. Now, if I pull up the visualizer, things become a little more interesting, right? Now that I can actually see that, you know, number one, I've got the cities on each of these vertices versus just a, a generic airport label. And I also now have the edges which contain the distances. The hints themselves are also able to provide uh, things like the direction of the edges. So this dash p hint here denotes that uh, when I'm when I'm visualizing this query, I'm going from a vertex through an outgoing edge to an incoming vertex. That that actually tells it which way to draw the arrows uh, for the edges. Um, you'll also notice that the the color comes into play here, right? Um, some of these things are actually the same color. Well, why is that? Well, also in this. Uh, these query hints, I can supply what's called a group using a dash G parameter to denote that I want want these colored and grouped by the country for the air the airport. So Atlanta, Austin, Charleston, Nashville are all in the United States, so they're all colored the same way. Whereas versus London and Bogota are different countries. So, do we want to uh, take a pause for a question? Sure. Uh, we got this one here um, from the Twitch chat from uh, our friend Arthur at G.V. Um, and it says, let's see here, maybe I can pop it on the screen. Uh, what's the rationale behind using path as the trigger for graph visualization? Um, would edges alone be enough to produce a graph output? Uh, edges alone with element map, I think. Um, and we can, uh, one of the things we'll actually see here in a minute is that, uh, we actually have the ability to use element map to help with some of these hints versus, you know, user providing the hints. We can actually use the aspects of element map to drive the visualization. Um, it's probably worth mentioning Taylor that when we did the initial visualization feature for the notebook, so we launched the notebooks initially just having text results. And then we did a next release after that, which had the visualization results. Before we did that, um, element map in Gremlin actually wasn't available. It was a step that, that came later. So because of the way Gremlin paths can be modulated using buys, you might do something as, where a path just has nodes, and the nodes that you return might just be, say, the city names. It may not even be all the, no all the properties of the nodes and the edges. Um, so we provided these hints, so even if the path that came back was didn't even have IDs and labels. You could still make a meaningful drawing if you had if you had the hints. What Taylor will show in a minute is that we actually recommend if you want to make a really nice visual that you do include both the nodes and the edges in the path, and then just do a path by element map. And from that, the visualizer can actually figure out everything else for itself. It can figure out the directions of the arrows, and and you can also do things like Taylor will show you bring up dialog boxes to show you all the properties and stuff like that. Behind the scenes, this is sending queries. Um, to the back end using the Python client. So it's using the Gremlin Python client and it's using it in the reference element mode. So we don't by default get back all of the nodes properties and all of the edges properties unless we actually ask for them in the query. So that's why you kind of have to put into the query enough information to do the visualization and, and then you can use these hints as well as needed. Uh, as Taylor will show, you probably won't need to use these hints for 90% of what you do, as long as you can do a path that ends in element map. But I'm sure Taylor's going to show us that pretty soon. Yeah, it's actually in the following cell. Yeah. Um, I'm actually interested to see what um, how tools might change uh, going forward after Tinkerpop 3.7 when uh, 
properties uh, are available on elements, uh, especially in particularly in the different language variants uh, that hasn't uh, that's a brand new thing. Um, and I don't know, I think it'll make I think it'll make tool building a lot easier because I know that's like kind of a hassle because uh, most folks are writing things like G.V or just returning an edge and then for a tool. Uh, to have to work with that, they have to do some extra steps in order to get all the properties uh, for visualization or uh, analysis or whatever it is. So um, th that that'll probably affect uh, how how Graph Notebook works uh, and and lots of other tools. Yeah, I think Stephen, if we'd had that when we did this originally, we wouldn't have done it this way. We the reason we did this was mainly I didn't really want to have to deal with parsing complex graphs on when we could just send a simple query and and have the the client do most of the work for us. But the downside was then you didn't get all of the node information, the edge information. So once there's that new feature that you mentioned where a user can say, I actually want all that information back, um, we could get rid of a lot of this need for any hinting at all because it will always be available. Yep. So kind of going along here, um, you know, Kelvin had mentioned something like the the, the search dialog box and, and also looking at the properties. So I'll just kind of show that briefly. Um, this this graph output also includes this little sh a search box here. So if you wanted to search on a given property that one of these vertices contains, you could just type in that property value here and it would highlight the the element that actually contains that, that property, right? So typing ATL, it's gonna show the Atlanta airport. Um, and if I wanna see the other properties for the Atlanta airport, I can highlight it. And there's this little hamburger button right here. If I click on that, this will show me all the other properties for the Atlanta airport, right? So just another way of, of kind of using this to, as you're, as you're writing queries and tr trying to figure out how to expose different elements of the graph, you can actually use this for a good way to do debugging, right? All right, so as, as we were kind of alluding to, a, a lot of this was built prior to element map. Element map introduces some different uh, optimizations here. So, so now with element map in my path output, if I do a path by element map, uh, I can actually yeah, do these kind of group uh, groupings and such, but in, in a way where I'm not going to supply as, as many hints, right? That actually supply the, the path hint anymore. I don't want to tell it that I'm coming from a vertex vertex going uh, to an outgoing edge and then an incoming vertex. Uh, the element map actually has enough information now to for the visualizer to use to 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 draw this in in a a more intuitive way. So, all right. Um. So the underlying engine for this, right? This is all open source. Uh, the underlying engine that we're using to draw all of this is uh, a library called VizJS. Um, VizJS has a uh, a number of ways to customize the the look and feel of these these graphs. Like one of the things you'll note is um, kind of wiggling this around. It, it you know as soon as I release my mouse button, one of the first things that happens is the physics engine that's it's kind of moving everything stops. Uh, we that's actually a tunable right. We've actually have set that a uh, default value for that so that you can draw some pretty rather large graphs and this is not going to you know, consume a ton of uh, memory from the browser. Uh, but you, we do expose the ability for you to change that. So if you if you want to, uh, let me kind of scroll down to this. We'll come back to some of these other examples here momentarily. I just want to kind of show you this real quick. And this is all in the example notebook for, for Gremlin. But down here towards the bottom is this changing visualization settings. Um, there's a magic here called Graph Notebook Viz Options. And if you run this, this actually has all the VizJS configuration, right? So if you want to go through and change this, uh, if you want to change the background color, uh, you know, the even the iconography for, for, for nodes and edges, you can actually add in, you know, uh, uh, icons from VizJS's icon library, right? Uh, and we have an example of that here. So I'm going to run this cell to change my visualization settings and then say rerun uh, this particular query. Uh, so, so this is actually changing. I probably should have run this before the I changed the settings, but this is actually changing the output of this particular query to be in a hierarchical format. 
right? Normally this would actually be in a, a format and actually let's go do that real quick. Since I actually ran this and got the settings prior, let me. You could actually show the reset feature, Taylor. You can just do percent graph uh, config with the, the word reset after it and it'll reset wow. it as a line magic. I didn't even know that. So was it again? Percent graph. It's, just, it's the viz options command again, but you just put the word reset after it. Okay. And it will put everything back to the default. So if you get yourself in a pickle and you've messed everything up, you can always reset back to the default. And that's the line magic or the cell magic? The line magic. All right. And then rerun this. Yeah. So this kind of goes back. You can kind of see here the, the more default way of, of, of drawing the graph, right? Uh, so this is actually not as intuitive to kind of trace if you're if you're trying to you know write this query here and this query is essentially starting with the airport as AUS as the airport code and trying to find the uh, the, the the paths to get to, to the Wellington Airport the L WLG so going from Austin to Wellington show me the the first set of paths going you know a breath first search from Austin down to Wellington you know you. The, the edges are all kind of all over the place. It doesn't really kind of make sense to a user. So if you wanted to change this to make it more intuitive to the user, you know, we could go back up here, rerun the cell that has these specific options. And now it changes this to a hierarchical representation, right? Can I uh, break in with a couple more questions? Sure. Um, it's a pretty interactive group, it seems. So this is good. Um, so we have, uh, let's see. Uh, can it, uh, can Graph Notebook be used with any Gremlin server implementation like RKDB and what are the requirements uh, to connect with it? Um, yeah, so yeah. As, under the covers, uh, Stephen, the, we just use the Gremlin Python client over WebSockets and we send the queries as text strings inside the WebSockets. So as long as you support Gremlin WebSockets, um, and you, you would norm ordinarily support the the Python client with the database you're using, then it should work with these notebooks. Okay. Yeah, I would say just to add to that, like in theory, I, there's there's a handful of of, the, of Tinkerpop compatible databases that we've tested, but I don't think we've tested everything. Um, you know, at the end of the session, I'll kind of cover the the GitHub repository for this, and there's a place in the GitHub repository that we can we can look at and see which ones we actually have notes around. Uh, but we're always willing to take additional notes. If, if people want to use this against other databases, we're, we're totally up to that, open to that. And we can add additional instructions for how to use this with other Tinkerpop compatible databases. Yeah, and we welcome pull requests too. So if you do find something that is an easy fix that you know how to fix that maybe we don't, we, we're really happy to get pull requests. So if it turned yeah. out that say RKDB didn't work for some reason and you knew how to fix it, we'll happily take a pull request. Yeah, and I think for you know any graph providers who are listening, um, you know for sure let us know if there's uh, if there's issues connecting um, because we can figure those out. Okay, we, cool. We, we, I'll just add, Stephen, we really do want this to be something the community can use and enjoy and contribute to. So, while those of us that, that worked on it, you know, also work with Neptune in our day jobs, we've gone out of our way to try and make this something that's available and open source and can be connected to other databases. So as Taylor said, there's some Neptune specific things in there because Neptune has a few features like that, but it should work mostly with any Gremlin server. And we would even welcome pull requests to make it work with others. I think Taylor, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think somebody wanted to connect it to Neo4j and they gave us a pull request for what they wanted. And I know we've had a couple of RDF stores where the providers have come back and said, what you've got doesn't quite work for us. Here's a, here's a pull request and they've made it work. So. Yeah, yeah we'd love, love to see it work with every graph database out there. Okay, cool. That's great. Um, another question. Um, is it possible to use a custom DSL on the notebook um, if I have my own classes that inherit graph traversal and graph traversal source? Um, I guess I, I can probably guess what the answer is to that. It, to, to some degree, I think it's going to depend on the graph database that you're connecting to. Uh, right. So if you have uh, Gremlin, if you're maintaining your own Gremlin server um, and you have your DSL uh, configured in that server, I don't see why that wouldn't work here because we're just sending uh, Gremlin uh, strings 
uh, over the Python client uh, directly to the server. So it should, in theory, work. But I, I don't think we've really tested that or tried that out. Yeah, it'll definitely depend on on the back end as well. You know, if there's any limitations or like, for example, Neptune doesn't support Lambda functions. So if you sent something like a Lambda, um, that wouldn't work with Neptune. But was, yeah, but as you said, Stephen, we just send the text string over. So whatever the back end does with that text string. I think we probably don't have it documented, but I, I don't see why there wouldn't be a way to have like client side DSLs work with this because a client side DSL is essentially just it's 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 a decorator, right? Um, so there's probably a way for us to get that to work. It's, I don't know if any examples of us doing that already today. Hmm. Okay. Maybe something we can kind of tinker with at some point just to prove it out and see how it, uh, see how that works. Right. Yeah. Like the, some of the client side strategies and, um, even like if you're doing, uh, you're building your own, your know, client side DSL, I, most of those are just kind of building, uh, you know, uh, yeah, adding you know has steps and such to the query before sending it off to the server. So there may be a way of kind of injecting that somewhere along the way inside a graph notebook. Um, and then uh, another another question here is kind of more of a technical sort of question. I'm not sure uh, how did how did you plug the graph visualization from Viz JS, a JavaScript framework, into the Jupyter notebook? Um, did you create some custom results visualizations? or functionality on graph notebook using that approach? Anyone know the answer to that one? Yeah, there's a few answers to that, actually. Um, there's more than one. Um, so in some cases, we've created custom widgets. So for example, the little table that you see the Gremlin console-like results in, some of those are actually custom widgets. Um, some of the things are just um, straight text results. In a few places, we actually use HTML. Um, and in this particular case, we're just using the ability that the notebooks have to allow our HTML canvas um, to be part of the result. So what you have here is sort of a widget that's got um, tabs in it. It's got sort of the little bar that Taylor showed with the various menus in it. And then the HTML canvas is um, being exposed um, down below. And as, as far as VJS is concerned, it's just rendering to an HTML canvas. And we've kind of wrapped a widget around that. So it's it's a mixture of HTML widgets and in some cases just straight text output. So, and again, if you're interested in how that's done, it, 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 we will make sure we pass on the Git repo uh, link before we're done. And you can actually go look at the code. All right. All right, that's it for questions for the moment. Yeah, great questions. Um, so just to show you some additional uh, options here for the visualizations. We mentioned changing the uh, like the icons. Um, you can kind of see here we're pulling in uh, country flag um, uh, icons to, to use as part of the visualization. So if I run this, these settings, and then rerun the uh, this particular query that's looking at this particular query here, you know, just for explanation purposes, we we're starting at the Cozumel airports. And we're looking at uh, all uh, paths from Cozumel to adjacent airports, right? So here, here we can actually see the uh, the country flags. Uh, at least the country flag for Cozumel. These are interesting. I think we gave different things, different settings, just to kind of show off uh, the feature. So we didn't. Oh, okay. We used the same thing for everything. So. Gotcha. There's various icon libraries and font libraries and other things that you can just plug into and VizJS will happily just use those in the results set. If people are interested, that the fraud notebook example that we have uses things like money symbols and all sorts of things for for the fraud graph. So th this is this is handy when when you want to make a visual that you're going to like share with your boss or something that's the final result of your research and you want to make it a bit more appealing than just circles and lines. So it's fully customizable. Yeah, the fraud data set. I think we actually had like people silhouettes and credit cards and yeah, money signs and stuff. So yeah, uh, very useful. Um, and then here's also we kind of got ahead of ourselves. Here's also the the reset, the the means of actually converting this uh, back to the original default settings. And yeah, maybe worth just mentioning, Taylor. Also, if people want to know a bit more about all the things that could go in that JSON, we don't use every single possible feature. But if you find the VisJS 
Git repo, they have pretty good documentation on their network layout, which is what we use and the physics that goes with it. And anything that works with the VisJS network layout setting should work here. So if you want to learn how to make the edges longer or mess with the gravity, deal with the springiness of the edges, all that kind of stuff, um, you can just read the VisJS docs and, and you sh should better just plug those into these JSON fields. Yeah. So that's kind of the bulk of um, the functionality for, for Graph Notebook. Kelvin, anything else I wanted to cover here before we kind of move on to deployment? Yeah, options? just one little thing. Right down at the very bottom, we should probably just show the graph, subst the variable substitution. Oh, yeah. that, that's a nice feature. So if you if you have a query and you want to like do some work in, say, Python outside the query and then just plug a value in, um, we do have a mechanism for doing that, which Taylor, you, you can walk through there, right? Yeah. So here we're just setting a, a Python variable of, of city with uh, the name of Los Angeles. And inside of the Gremlin query, we're, we're able to, to reference that using this dollar sign curly braces notation. So and very useful is, is your, I, your, yeah, your building. Say, th this is not designed to kind of replace Gremlin query parameterization, right. which is a little bit different. But this does give you a complete round trip capability between the queries and the language. So with, with store two for the results and the variable injection um, on the other direction, you can actually build a complete workflow between sort of Python, Python libraries and, and the query language. And, and one thing worth mentioning, I think, Taylor, is that a store two result, which is like a list of value maps. So say, for example, you have a query that returns 10 value maps in a list. The pandas um, library, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, a way of working with spreadsheet-like data in Python will accept that as is, as you can just say load this result, which is a list of value maps, which is key value pairs. And then if you want to build pie charts, bar graphs, do spreadsheet analysis on your graph results, you can do all that right in the notebook. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's also important to note too, um, each of these notebooks are uh, effectively equate to a single client. Right. So uh, one of the things, at least that I've come across in, in the past, is if I want to do any kind of level of concurrency and, and run multiple queries together, I'm not going to be able to do that in a single notebook. Right. So just kind of calling that out. If if you if you plan on trying to do anything where you want to send, you know, 10 parallel queries to uh, your back end store and, and get results you know, and have all those queries run concurrently, um, you would have to have like 10 separate notebooks or you have to just set up a Python script that runs somewhere else that uses like a you know, multi-threading or multi-processing. So just FYI on that. Yeah, and I don't think we have an example of it here, but if you want, you know, just for people listening, if you want to get into slightly more advanced Jupyter Notebook things, um, you can, from Python code, call a cell or a line magic. And it's actually like two or three lines of Python code just to set that up. So you can actually, if you wanted to, write Python code that called our magics. Um, straight from Python code. So that's another way you can do some of these things you know, programmatically. Yeah, so let's let's kind of pivot over and talk about um, how to get started, right? Um, I think first and foremost, we've mentioned this before, all of this is out on GitHub. If you go out to github.com slash AWS slash graph dash notebook, that's the repo for this. Uh, you know, we, we're more than happy to to collaborate uh, with others, and we have in the past uh, collaborated with with external entities to, to help build in integration for this. Um, in particular, uh, just while we're at it, there's this additional databases folder here uh, in the repo, and this includes a bunch of other third party stores that we've we've actually worked with. Um, so, you know, obviously, you know, quite a few different RDF stores we've worked with to to support this, um, but I think it would be awesome to have you know information here on you know, how to use this with RKDB. You know, I think we've actually even had people use this with Janus at some point. So, um, you know, we we can continue to add on to this. Uh, so you could just go fork the repo or clone the repo and and build this from source. Uh, also, note we we do push this out to PyPy as a uh, a packaged Python library. So you could just go and do a pip install. Uh, graph notebook there are some additional requirements with that you have to have like jupyter server installed and stuff um we actually note that further down here in the readme um but you could just go build this from either build it from the source or deploy it from from PyPy. the easiest way in my opinion to use this is we do package this up as a uh a container image uh, so docker image 
Um, it's out on the the AWS uh, Elastic Container Repository, the, the our, our hub out there. Um, so if you just go out to ecr.aws, you can do a search for Graph Notebook. This will take you to the Graph Notebook uh, repository, and this has the the latest version of of Graph Notebook. Um, and a lot of the times when I'm using this, uh, I just use it locally with Gremlin Server, right? Uh, if you don't already know this, Tinkerpop also publishes uh, versions of, of Gremlin Server onto Docker Hub. So you could go out and just fetch the, the, the most recent Gremlin Server Docker image, fetch the most recent Graph Notebook image, have both those up and running, and you've got a great little local development environment to get started um, with using uh, Gremlin Server. So um, definitely something that I found very useful, and I know a lot of others have as well. So. I would say that's probably the easiest way to download this and get started. If you're using um, AWS and Neptune, I'm uh, just kind of hit on this. Inside the Neptune console, we, we've actually have built Graph Notebook uh, uh, as a, a managed service inside of Neptune. So on the, on the left-hand side here, you can just go to Notebooks. I have, have it here. Um, this will create a, a notebook instance. This is based on uh, the AWS SageMaker uh, Notebooks service. So it creates a SageMaker notebook instance and installs Graph Notebook on top of it. Um, and then from there, you can just you know, launch Jupyter from the console. And this pulls up uh, the, the notebook instance that I was using earlier for, um, for the demos. Uh, yeah, I guess before I, I go off of this tangent real quick, um, the, the Neptune specific magics, right? There's like things like status and, and load that we've actually created that uses our bulk loader. Um, there are a few of them here that you can also use directly with Neptune. So, and something I think I'd like to do, and this, Stephen, this is something I think we've talked about a bit, is maybe add like a status type feature to Gremlin Server too. So that that, that there's nothing special about that status; it just calls an endpoint that is actually host slash status. So it'd be kind of nice actually if we could put something into like Gremlin Server there, where status would work with Gremlin Server as well and give back whatever made sense. Yeah, I think Gremlin server's kind of missing that, needs that that endpoint, actually. Yeah, how many times have we actually checked Gremlin server to see if it's up by just hitting the Gremlin endpoint and getting the, was it no Gremlin script specified? G dot, or, yeah. G.inject zeros. Oh, uh, you already that. Yeah, one plus one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, Kelvin, anything else that we want to hit on? Are there any more questions, Stephen, before we you know, dive into any more? No, there, I mean, nothing in the chat yet. Um, I don't know if anyone's holding back until we kind of got to the end, um, but we're happy to take uh, additional questions uh, if you have them. One thing I'll mention while we're doing this, one thing you cannot do with this is kind of point and click exploration. So when you actually um, have the graph, if you wanted to say, see the next level of nodes after the ones you've visualized, you'd go back and change your query and, and run the query again. We do have a um, sort of sibling um, open source project called Graph Explorer, which is right now aimed at the non-query writer. So it's kind of a no code um, Graph Explorer. So if you're interested in kind of a faceted search approach to graph exploration, where you just want to sort of figure out, oh, my graph has airplanes in it or airports or routes or whatever you could kind of just click on a faceted search um, bar to say show me airports in you know texas or something like that and they'd appear and then you could point and click and navigate your way um through the graph without um needing to know anything about the query languages and that that tool also supports both rdf um and gremlin tinkerpop stores and we're, we're adding support to it also for for the open cipher query language as well so Slightly different tool, um, not really aimed at the query writer, more aimed at the point and click analyst. Um, but you know, that's another project. If you're interested, um, we can we can share the link. Basically, basically the same link as the other one, but with Graph Explorer rather than Graph Notebook. Uh, we do have a uh, another question here. What sort of analytics do Graph Notebook users typically perform? Uh, Pandas, Network X, uh, other examples. I don't know whether you have it available, Taylor, but I guess the third open source project we could mention is the um, SDK for Pandas. Um, there, there is 
work we've done to integrate um, code that you can wor work with these notebooks with, um, certainly in an AWS environment with, with the SDK for Pandas. So you could actually just um, get data back um, from a graph using that and then run graph algorithms over it. Um, I've also just using the graph notebook and the store to um, taken the results of um, a graph query, or sometimes in some cases dump the whole graph, and then run run network X alongside um, the uh, the graph to do algorithms. So it depends on, on where you're coming from. If if you're it, certainly if you're using Neptune, the the AWS SDK for pandas makes it really easy to to do that. Uh, it integrates really nicely. But you could certainly use network X. We have people doing that, and also people doing more business like visualizations often use things like matplotlib um, in conjunction with these notebooks. The nice thing is with the notebook paradigm, you can pull all that together um, into the notebook and you can do machine learning or whatever else it is that you might be doing, um, staying pretty much in the same notebook the whole time. Uh, the follow on follow on question, um, and I think this one kind of comes up into with all these all these tools. But uh, uh, what volume of data do you typically see users handle via graph notebook for analytical purposes? As much as you can fit into memory, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's really kind of the constraint. A lot of times is um, if you're if you're using this with pandas, however much you can fit into the memory of the instance that you're using. Uh, which could be go into the millions pretty easily. Um, when you start getting maybe to, into the billions, that could be cumbersome in a single instance. So it, it may be kind of serializing things down to files um, and doing things incrementally using pandas. But uh, but yeah, I think that's the big constraint. Oh, Kelvin, if you have a kind of an opinion on that. No, I think I think you covered it. I mean, the, the the backend graph could have billions of nodes in it, but you certainly wouldn't want to try and visualize more than a few thousand nodes um, in the notebook. The, the, the VJS technology is just HTML canvas. It's not even, uh, as far as I'm aware, WebGL based. So I, I've visualized 50,000 nodes with it. And you know the browser will you know, maybe handle it, but it starts to struggle at that kind of scale if you're going to try and visualize it. Yeah. In terms of loading data down for running an algorithm, though, you can certainly load tens of millions of results fairly well um, and still you know, like run Network X, pandas, whatever, over it. So it depends a bit about, like Taylor said, how big the instance is, how much memory it's got, and exactly what you're doing. Visualization, probably you don't want to try and visualize you know, realistically more than a few hundred or a few thousand nodes. For computation, like PageRank or something like that, you could do a, you know, several million for sure. But you know, like Taylor said, not billions. Yeah, yeah. G.V is uh, agreeing. Uh... <laughs> I think with graph viz, we all expect realistically it would be tens of thousands max. So yeah, yeah, he's he's right there with us. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? I think uh, I think we're kind of wrapping up um, right at the end of the hour here. Um, I guess one last one that I did think of is uh, we've been doing a lot of this in Jupyter Notebook, right? And there are other kind of Jupyter. Uh, uh, I guess modalities, for, for lack of a better word, um, that you could use with this. Uh, we also do support Jupyter Lab, although I don't think that actually is part of the container that we ship. Um, but uh, this does work with Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab. So, uh, does Graph Notebook come with a specific functionality tailored for Neptune and machine learning? Okay, it actually, it actually does. Yes. So. Um, probably a bit of a tangential discussion, but just very, very briefly, um, Neptune does have a feature called Neptune ML, Neptune Machine Learning. And what we've integrated into the notebooks is magic commands to make it easier to export your data to a model, train the model, and then run queries that are embellished by the results of, of that model. So if you're doing link prediction, you know, for example, um, you know, what kind of movie is Toy Story? Is it good for kids? You know, that, that kind of thing. Um, yes, um, you, that is part of the integration we've done. Um, so you will see, if you do it like Taylor's doing an LS Magic, you'll see machine language specific um, integrations. And, and this is an area we're definitely interested in growing more, not, not just you know, for Neptune, but for Graph Notebook in general. There's so much interest right now around generative AI, large language models, and machine learning in general that 
it's an area where I imagine that we will be able to you know, add more features to the notebook. Okay. Well, I think uh, I think that's it for today. Um, thank you, uh, Taylor and Kelvin, for uh, running running us through the graph notebook. I definitely learned uh, learned a few things uh, while going through. Um, I'm being sort of a Gremlin console guy uh, to the end, but uh, <laughs> but I do I do get into do get into the notebooks, um, do get into uh, uh, some of the tools like G.V for helping with uh, debugging and stuff. So I think uh, yeah, there's there's lots of other things beyond just uh, just the console. So um, appreciate this today, um, and thank you everyone for all the questions and the uh, interactivity on the chat. Uh, take care until the next one. Yep. Thanks everybody. Thank you.